Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week has had a life very much shaped by events. Bill Browder was a young American capitalist who went to Russia to make his fortune, and he did. But then he fell foul of Vladimir Putin, and he has spent many, many years campaigning against corruption in Russia, trying to get international governments to pass laws to sanction corrupt individuals in Russia. And he's been warning about the dangers of Vladimir Putin for years, often going not really listened to until now, of course, until the war in Ukraine. And so his story has come back very much to the forefront at the same time as his latest book and account of his campaign and how Russia has treated him and the sort of the strange cat and mouse life that he has lived as a result. And it's called Freezing Order, a true story of money laundering, murder and surviving Vladimir Putin. Bill Browder, thank you very much for joining me. Let's begin really with with basics, because many people will have heard very much about Magnitsky laws around the world, but won't really know who Magnitsky was. So tell us, First of all, Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer in Russia. He was um, uh, working for me at the time that the things really got ugly with the Russian government. I was a fund manager in Russia. I set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund. For many years, it was successful. I then started to expose corruption in the companies I was investing in. The Russian authorities expelled me from the country, declared me a threat to national security, raided my offices seized all of my documents, and then used those documents to perpetrate a a very complex $230 million tax rebate fraud. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer who I had hired to try to figure out why they had raided the office and, and what this fraud was all about. And he figured out who was involved, um, the role they played, who got the money from the fraud. And he testified against the officials involved and in retaliation, he was arrested, he was tortured for 358 days, and he was killed in Russian police custody in, on November 16, 2009, at the age of 37. And since then, I've made it my life's mission to go after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. So this was a, this was a theft, effectively, a fraud, which they were accusing you of. But somewhere in the line, corrupt officials actually got that money and got it out of Russia. Is that right? They had applied for this $230 million uh, tax rebate, which was approved in one day on Christmas Eve. It was the largest tax rebate in the history of Russia. And um, they got this money, spirited the money out of the country. And that's when we got involved in exposing it. And then they accused us of doing the crime after we exposed it. And it's very similar to, to many things we see Russians doing these days, where they they commit a crime and then they accuse their victims of committing the crime. Like in Ukraine right now, they said the Ukrainians did the massacre, not them type of thing. So why had you fallen foul of Putin and his authorities? Because you had gone there, you had made a lot of money and you had defended Putin. You had said he was a good thing initially even when he had gone after some of those early oligarchs? My original thought was um, when Vladimir Putin had come in, it was the um, oligarchs who were the really bad guys. 22 oligarchs controlled 40% of the country and everyone else was in destitute poverty. And I really felt offended by that and so did everybody else. And so we were all hoping for some change. And then this guy comes in, Vladimir Putin, no one knows who he is. And he says he's going to tame the oligarchs and and bring them uh, under control and stop this sort of injustice from happening. And and so everybody was very hopeful, and and I was too. And he comes in, and for the first couple of years, he actually does things that look sort of more like a technocrat than a dictator. And um, and he arrested the first oligarch, a guy named Mikhail Hordakovsky. He was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. So he arrests this first oligarch, and it turned out that Putin wasn't interested in getting rid of the oligarchs. He just wanted to become the biggest oligarch himself. And since um, since the arrest of Hordakovsky in 2003, Putin has become the richest man in the world. 
So, so what about the money you were making? I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of people will say, well, hang on, you were there during those early years when the oligarchs were getting rich, when Russia was being, you know, exploited and its natural resources were being given away. I mean, put legality aside one second. I mean, how, how morally comfortable are you with the money you were making through Hermitage at that time? Well, so so my, my investment strategy was something different than anyone else's. I was going into companies that were really um, badly managed and exposed, you know, multiple multi-billion dollar uh, theft schemes. And share bank. prices went up and so you made lots of money. Exactly. So I don't think anyone would argue with the morality of that, if, if if you can make money and do good in the same th- in the same time, it was actually a very wonderful business. There's very few things you can do in life where you can make money and do good. You can. There's a lot of things where you can make money and not do good, and we see lots of examples of that. There's lots of things where you can do good and not make any money, and I know lots of people in those professions as well. But to actually have a, a job where you could do both was was pretty um, amazing and unbelievable, and and very rewarding from all different standpoints. Just jump forward to 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 the current, you know, if you will, for a moment. I mean, you, you've been doing interviews and keeping your profile up and writing books about what's happened in your struggle um, to try and keep getting the laws changed in lots of different countries for years. And and the amount of attention you get kind of varies over time. Now, of course, you know, you're you're the guy who was warning about Putin all along. Um, and people are saying, well, you know, we should have listened to Bill Browder. Have, have you felt frustrated looking at everything since the invasion of Ukraine, saying, well, if you'd listened to me a little earlier, then we wouldn't be in this situation? I think frustrated is a, a gross understatement. I, I, f- I feel infuriated. I, as I watch the pictures of these civilian casualties and, and watch these stories coming out of Ukraine, it just, I, my, my heart breaks. And I feel just terrible. I mean, it's it's horrible to 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 see what what happened there, and what's happening there, what will happen there, and and we could have done something about it. And I mean, it was we we've had such a terrible approach towards Russia here in the UK and the US and and all of our European allies. We've all looked the other way for so long, and. Um, and as a result, Vladimir Putin got more and more emboldened, and he thought he could, he thought we would always be small-minded and narrowly interested in our own financial interests that we wouldn't say anything or do anything. Because for twenty years, when he when he committed all sorts of other atrocities, which, I mean, this is the biggest, but but he's committed lots of other atrocities, which which have been plain and obvious, and we've not done anything, and I feel terrible about it. I mean, do you think there was ever a scenario in which Putin would have been removed? Or did he already have such a grip on power that he was always going to be there? Well, I mean, that's been his main objective is to is to be in power and stay in power forever. And so I'm not sure if he'd ever been removed, but Putin is a guy who can also be contained. He can be constrained if he understands that there's really hard barriers. If we had started imposing just a, a very small portion of the sanctions that we're doing right now, um, if we had started imposing them after he invaded Georgia, which is in 2008, or after he took Crimea in 2014, or after he bombed civilians in Syria, or after he poisoned the Skripals in Salisbury, if we had done anything bigger and more persuasive to him than we had done, he might have thought differently about the, the risks and rewards of doing a full-scale invasion in Ukraine. But he was convinced that that you know look at this history of of our weak hand for twenty years and and th- this is what we have to show for it. I mean, when you say you know if we'd have done more, you're talking about whether countries would have enacted the legislation that they had started passing earlier. So just tell us, you know, what what in bro- obviously different countries have different laws, but in broad terms, what do the Magnitsky Acts allow governments to do? So the Magnitsky Act is named after Sergei Magnitsky, my lawyer, who I mentioned was killed in, in Russian police custody. And it's a piece of legislation which was put in place when the Russians basically tried to cover up the whole crime and pretend it didn't happen. And what it does is it freezes the assets and bans the visas of individual uh, officials involved in human rights abuse and involved in corruption. 
The first Magnitsky Act was passed in the United States in 2012, followed by Canada, uh, followed by the UK, followed by the European Union, followed by Australia, and then various other countries like Norway and Montenegro and others. There are now 34 countries that have the Magnitsky Act in place. And it, it was really sort of groundbreaking in the sense that in the past, before the Magnitsky Act, the only sanctions that were ever imposed were countrywide sanctions to say full, full-scale trade sanctions. And what the Magnitsky Act does um, is it singles out bad actors in these countries and targets them specifically. And it's particularly useful in a country like Russia, where you have these um, bad actors who are also very rich. And in fact, most of their bad actions are to get rich and then to keep that money offshore. And so this basically hits the Achilles heel of the Putin regime because they steal all the money in Russia and then they keep that money in the West. And so the Magnitsky Act is is also now the template for what's being used against the oligarchs and all the other corrupt officials um, to sanction, to freeze their money and to ban their their travel. And and so it's really a, a, a tremendous tool. And to come back to the whole what we should have done, uh, we we when when we when I got the Magnitsky Act passed, it was like pulling teeth. Every every country resisted. Nobody wanted to be tough on Russia. They, it was just remarkable how how every every government really wanted to just tamp just put sweep it under the carpet not not have this you know provocative law in place and it was only because of Putin's bad actions so for example in the parliament here i i had many members of parliament proposing the magnitsky act for many years and the government always blocked it up until the moment that uh putin did um, did his uh, Salisbury poisoning of the, of the Skripals. Why not? I mean, you know, well, why do you think that resistance was there? Well, I think it was a combination of money and fear. Um, everybody loved the Russian money that was coming here. And um, everybody was, was afraid that Vladimir Putin would like single us out and seize BP's assets or, you know, I don't know what, but, but everybody wanted to just like avoid the issue. And the easy way of avoiding the issue is to block the Magnitsky Act. And, and um, you know, this country in particular, you know, they, they call, they, well, they call London, London grad. And that's not a um, exaggeration. There was so much Russian money sloshing around here. And, and why was London the place that became London grad? I mean, is it as simple as a lot of people like being in London and like sending their children to British public schools and all of that? I guess there are several reasons. One, one is that um, as unsafe physically as Russia is, it's pretty safe here physically. But also there are um, rules of rule of law and property rights here. So if, if somebody has a lot of money that they've stolen in Russia, they could bring it here, uh, keep, it, keep it here and know that, that nobody was going to take it away from them here. And then to to make to, to add sort of icing to the cake, we have a rule of law, but there's no law enforcement here. And as a result of of not having any law enforcement, they know these people knew that there was not any chance that anyone would ask any awkward questions about the money. And there's been like I don't think there's been one single economic crime investigation into a Russian in the last twenty years here. So what what has been driving your your campaign to both change the law and get the law, you know, um, used? By, by governments. I mean, is, to what extent is it self-preservation? Because obviously you have to keep your own story in the headlines to preserve your own personal safety as well, don't you? That, that's, that, that, that's true, but that's not the primary driver. The primary driver for me is, and what's been driving me for the last 12 years, is Sergei Magnitsky. He was a young man in my service who worked for me. And for me, the the burden of guilt of his death is, is, you know hangs over me every day and um and that it, it it hurts it hurts a lot that 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 he's not alive because of me and um the one thing i can do that brings me a tiny bit of comfort is to get justice for him and um and and i have been um, and it's not true justice it's not it's not um, putting the people who killed him in jail for the rest of their lives for murder, but it is 
uh, you know, by freezing their assets and naming their names and making their lives miserable, it is better than total impunity. And, and, um, and moreover, the other thing that, that I get from it is that Sergei Magnitsky has a legacy. People know his name all over the world now. Other victims um, in all countries, this doesn't just apply to Russia, can use the Magnitsky Act um, to deal with their perpetrators. And, and I, I, I hope and I think that as this law becomes more um, used and it becomes pervasive, that a lot of people may say, you know, I'm not going to go and kill that prisoner because I don't want to end up having my assets frozen. And so lives will be saved because of Sergei Magnitsky's sacrifice. Yet, yet behavior doesn't seem to be changing right now, does it? I mean, take somebody like Vladimir Karamutz. I interviewed him for Channel 4 News very recently. I talked to him about his own personal safety. And, you know, he seemed determined to carry on saying the things he was saying, knowing it was dangerous. And then he gets arrested. A man who's, who, who's, who they've tried to kill twice already, at least. Um, and they're still, they're still going after him. Yeah, I, I know Vladimir Karamurza very well. Vladimir, in fact, he features um, very prominently in my book because he, he was somebody who worked with me on getting the Magnitsky Act passed around the world. And um, when I, whenever I would show up at a, at a parliament, he, whether it's here or Canada or the European parliament or U.S. Congress, he would be along my side. And I would argue um, sort of the international argument for why the Magnitsky Act was necessary. And he would argue the Russian uh, argument, explaining how uh, it it's helps the Russians to uh, punish the crooks who are stealing money from the Russian people. And, and he was punished for that extremely harshly, as you mentioned, uh, after the Magnitsky Act was passed in various countries, uh, they tried to kill him. And um, they poisoned him and came within, an, he, he literally came within an inch of his life. He was almost dead. And he, he remarkably <clears throat> was able to pull out of this death spiral and uh, recover. And it wasn't an easy recovery. He was like, he had, to, he had a stroke while he was in a coma and he had to learn to walk again and eat and talk. But he pulled himself together and, and eventually recovered. And then they poisoned him again. And, um, and I was with him about three weeks ago in London. He had, he was, he told me he was in London and I said, oh, that's, that's great. Why don't you come with me to a, uh, a Ukrainian fundraiser to help Ukrainian refugees? And, and he came and we both gave speeches and he said, didn't mince words about Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine and so on. And then we had dinner afterwards and I said, are you coming to my book party in Washington? He said, yeah, I'm coming for sure, um, but I've got to go to Moscow first. And I was really upset when I heard that, you know, because they already tried to kill him twice. I said, no, don't go, don't go. And he said, I have to go because um, I'm, I'm a Russian politician, an opposition politician, and I'm asking the Russian people to stand up to Vladimir Putin. How do I have any credibility doing that if I, if I don't go to Russia? And I said, well, I'm sure you have lots of credibility. Why don't you just wait three months? A war has started. You know, whatever, whatever the calculations were before, they're going to be different now. Just don't go. Um, and he, um, he went. And he gave an interview on MSNBC and then on CNN where he called Vladimir Putin a killer, a murderer. And an hour after his CNN interview, he was arrested. And um, he he's currently sits in a Russian jail do you think if he's in jail, he is relatively safe? You know, is it safer being in the system than being out there where you can be mysteriously assassinated? I don't think so at all. Uh, look at Sergei Magnitsky. I don't think that Putin cares anymore. Um, uh, Putin at this point, had, he always used to care. He used to care what the West thought because um, he wanted to go to the, you know, be feted at the G20 and... and um, go to the World Economic Forum in Davos and host international sports events. And um, he's kind of given all that up now. He's got both feet in the criminal world, and I don't think he cares. And it's really scary. Um, everything is really scary. Scary for Vladimir, for sure, in their custody. Scary for me and all the other dissidents who have been criticizing Putin, because now whatever restraint he ever felt, he no longer 
feels. If you're right about that, then that's obviously very scary for any kind of resolution. You know, if he doesn't care anymore about how he's seen in the world. Yep, I agree. And so, you know, it used to be that that um, sanctions were a uh, potential deterrent. Uh, if we had if we had imposed sanctions and we had been serious about sanctions in advance of the invasion of Ukraine, Putin might have thought differently about it. Putin is, is he's a very rational guy, and he he saw that we 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 were never doing anything, and so he invaded Ukraine. Now that he's invaded, Putin has no capacity to change course. He's not going to change. He's not going to back down. He's he's all in, and so the purpose of sanctions at this point is really just to degrade his economic capacity to fight this war. It's not to convince him to do anything. Can I again just sort of double back a little bit to ask you about how? You have achieved this because I mean there will be people listening who go well. There must be all sorts of people out there in the world who want to change laws, who want to do things with good reasons. Perhaps not because of a murder, but because of perfectly good reasons. Somehow you have achieved it. What, what has been the difference? What have you done? How have you done it? Well, there's been a few things. Um, the first thing is that um, it's it's very personal. So um, when I go and I speak to members of parliament here or in Europe or Canada or or America, I'm not talking about something abstract. I'm talking about something deeply personal, the murder of a, of an employee and a friend and, and, and the power of, of an individual story is sometimes, you know, infinitely greater than talking about statistics or, or anything like anything like that. And, and in fact, uh, the person who originated the Magnitsky Act in the United States uh, is a, a congressman from Massachusetts named Jim McGovern. And he said those exact words a couple of days ago when we were on a, uh, another podcast together. He was saying, when I heard Bill Browder, it was just so different than hearing other human rights activists who come in with, with reams of statistics. And so that, that was the first thing. So the story. But the second thing is that um, I was more committed to getting it done then the then my opponents um were were committed to stopping me and and this was a long process it it took didn't take that long to get the US Magnitsky act done it took about Sergei Magnitsky died in in 2009 and it was passed in 2012 so it took 3 years but it took me until 2018 so 9 years to get the UK to do a Magnitsky act and 2020 to get the European Union to do a Magnitsky act and so I mean, this is like a decade-long campaign, and most people get discouraged you know, after a few weeks of things. You know, to do something like this, you know, requires a total, absolute commitment, and and it also required me to give up everything else in my life. I used to be a businessman; I gave up business. I don't make any money anymore. I spend money. You know, to do something really like this, you know, ten years of total commitment. And putting myself at great personal risk, it's not, it's not easy, let's say. But um, but we now have 34 countries that have a Magnitsky Act. And so there is a big, you know, uh, sort of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, uh, and and I do feel, I, I don't feel good because I'm always going to feel about, you know, the the, the terrible guilt of, of Sergei's death. But, but I feel, I, I feel like there's something there. There's some legacy for Sergey, and there's something that, you know, I've, I've had a meaningful contribution to trying to right this terrible wrong. Because what, what you've also done is used, used the system and laws of different countries to try and do that. But, but was there a danger that you might have achieved all these pieces of legislation, but had it not been for the war in Ukraine, they might not really have been used? So they might not really have made the difference. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I always said when I was going through this process that getting getting these Magnitsky laws passed was only half the battle. The other half was getting them to use the Magnitsky laws, and 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 it's still the problem. I mean, so okay, we have the war in Ukraine, and 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 everyone's opened their eyes to Putin, but look at China. You know, there's concentration camps being set up in in Xinjiang, rounding up millions of Uyghurs and trying to basically eradicate them. You know, how many people have been sanctioned in China? Four. <laughs> That's not enough. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's an ongoing problem. And the, there's lots and lots of, of cynical people. There's lots and lots of uh, people who are just interested in money. 
And it's a very hard thing to overcome. There's no question. Is, is, that, is that easier for you to say, though, because you have money? Well, the, the one thing that's easier for me to say is that because I don't have to earn money to stay alive, I can really devote my, my time and my energies to this campaign. And um, as far as you know, people making money or not making money, and we should care about um, uh, obviously living in a world that we want to live in. And I don't want to live in a world where um, genocide is taking place in, in Xinjiang. And I don't want to live in a world where, where um, people are, are massacred with their hands tied behind their backs in Bucha. And, and I don't think most people would. And I think most people would probably say, you know, I could live a slightly less good standard of living if I, if need be. So, um, you know, I don't live in a, in a world of brutality. Of course, the, the irony is, of course, that within, within your family is that your grandfather was, was a communist, a communist in America, and you became a capitalist in Russia. Yeah, it's like the, uh, um, the son of the circus clown who goes on to become an accountant. Um, you know, so so in, in my case, uh, it was the driving force for me to go, to go to Russia was the rebellion against this family of communists. But people ask me, you know, so what would your grandfather think of you now? And, um, uh, and, the, and the answer is that in a certain way, we've had the same, same trajectory, you know, with different, you can put different um, political or economic models on the name of what we do, we do. But he was a champion for the underdog as a communist. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up being as well. There's something, something you know, very basic about that in in our gene pool that that has led me to end up as a human rights activist after all this. Had it, had it rubbed off on his children? So were you brought up with with that same kind of socialist ethos in America, which I can imagine must have been pretty weird. So my grandfather was a communist, um, and my father became a, a mathematician and very unpolitical. But at the dinner table, we were always taught that businessmen were crooks. That was like the mantra every day businessmen are crooks and all these people are trying to steal from the masses and so on and so forth and and so it was really kind of quite of a heavy rebellion to, to become a businessman and and it took my father a long time to ever accept that i was a good guy after that but um i think he finally saw he saw what i was doing uh, he's no no longer with us but uh you know towards the end of his life he saw what i was doing and i think he was pretty pretty happy and and proud of what i was doing so having swum with, with business people and politicians, you know, to what extent was your dad right? I mean, what, what, what proportion of business people are crooks, do you think? <laughs> well, not as many as my father thought. I think he thought it was universal. But he's not entirely wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, and particularly in the world that I was living in, I was, I was not just a businessman. I was a hedge fund manager. And, and there's some really horrible people in that world, horrible, horrible people. And there's a few good ones, but but mostly not so good. And um, business is a um, you know the, to taking it to its logical extreme is a is a pretty brutal you know system where you know nothing matters other than profits. And the, some of the best businessmen are the ones who who discard all other thoughts. And um, now, I mean, there's also some good businessmen, but you know, I guess what I would say is you can't have unbridled capitalism. You need to have you know, governments and regulation and rules and laws and and hopefully morals um, over overlaying that. I mean, as you've made clear throughout, and it's clear in your book. I mean, I think your book ends with it as well. You know, the the, the fight, your fight, goes on and will go on. I'm sure for the rest of your life. To look at Britain specifically, where Britain claims now to be leading the world when it comes to Ukraine and Russian sanctions and everything it's doing. I mean, to what extent? Is Britain leading the world, and to what extent has it got an awful lot to do when it comes to tackling Russian money? Well, I think both. I, I, I agree that Britain is leading the world when it comes to supplying weapons to Ukraine, and I praise Boris Johnson for doing that. He was front and center on giving Ukrainians weapons, which has been hugely important in this fight. And he's also been front and center in terms of, of uh, sanctioning oligarchs. It started slow, and I was very frustrated, but I think it's really picked up. And we have a lot of uh, really uh, heinous oligarchs on the sanctions list. But there's one huge, huge problem here, which hasn't been fixed, which is that the, all, the entire infrastructure uh, 
of of the system here allowed all this dirty money to come into this country. And nobody has made any structural changes so that it becomes a, a toxic and hostile environment for dirty money for Russians and others. It's still the same system. There's still the same unbelievably weak law enforcement. And I, I don't know how that's going to change because I don't see anyone doing anything about that right now. And, and do you think that the sanctions that have been announced so far are getting to all the places they need to, or is there still an awful lot of Russian money and a lot of Russian individuals able to act w with impunity in London? Well, I think there's a lot more Russians that need to be sanctioned. So if we look at the total sanctions list across all countries, there's 32 uh, oligarchs sanctioned, and there's 118 oligarchs who are on the Forbes rich list. And so there's a lot more oligarchs who need to be sanctioned. But we, but we finally have gotten some big ones, and that's really helpful in my opinion. And by going after them, you know, you hit, you, you know, you really hit the, hit the regime. But, you know, if, if there's 118 people on the list, it need, there more work needs to be done. And, and I think more work will be done. I, I don't think that this is, I don't think they've said, okay, we're done now. We've, we've got a complete list of people we're going to sanction. I think every new atrocity leads to a new impetus to, try, to sanction more people. And do you think ultimately when, when this round of war is done, Putin will still be in power. Well, that's his objective. I think the reason he's made this invasion and did this invasion in the first place is to stay in power. I don't think this is about NATO. I don't think this is about uh, e the Ukrainians wanting to join the EU. I think that the main reason that Putin did the invasion is because he uses war as a way of solidifying his position and running Russia. And it's not the first time he's done it. He invaded Georgia in 2008. His approval ratings rose. He did the same thing with Crimea in 2014, and his approval ratings went up. And, and now his approval ratings are sky high. This is what a dictator does, comes straight out of the dictator's playbook. And so I think his intention is to stay in power until the end of his natural life. And in my opinion, I think the probability of him not being in power because of the risks he's taking uh, right now as, as much higher than it was, let's say, three months ago. But Putin obviously, you know, made his own calculation and, and thought that that if if he didn't do something like this, that he'd end up with an uprising at some point where he'd lose power, like what happened in Kazakhstan in January, where the people rose up kind of unexpectedly and ended up taking out their dictator, a guy named Nazarbayev. So finally, Bill Browder, having campaigned and won Magnitsky acts in many countries around the world over many years, if you could just change the world with one swoop, a wave of a magic wand, what would you do? There's an expression that um, uh, sunlight kills all is the best disinfectant. I think that every bit of confidentiality of what goes on allows bad guys do bad things. And so there should be no more, you know, everybody should know who owns what, all properties, all companies. Everybody should know who's tweeting what. There shouldn't be any anonymous uh, Twitter accounts. I think if everybody sort of showed their face in all, in all aspects of life, I think that it would be a lot easier to have a, a, a cleanup of all the dirty stuff that still exists in the world. So we'd all, we'd all, announce what's in our bank account? Um, I don't know if we have to announce what's in our bank account, but but if if there's a property, you know, in central London, who owns that property? It's not a BVI company owned by a Cypress company, you know, in a uh, a Nairu trust, but but there's a person who owns that house and um, and who owns and who owns those companies. And so, you know, that we all kind of know who's got what. And if we did that, then there wouldn't be all of this dirty money sloshing around here you know, blood money, which, which is what's led to all these terrible conflicts. Bill Browder, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. If you did, then please do give us a rating or a review. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Nina Hodgson. Until next time, bye-bye.